Welcome to the Vantage Seminar for the fall 2024 season. And this season we're going to start early in August and end uh, before Thanksgiving. So our topic for the fall is the Treza class and algebraic cycles. And we're very happy to have Ari Schnidman here as our first speaker talking about vanishing criteria for Treza cycles and examples. And Ari, is it all right if we record your talk? Yep. Wonderful. And um, and we'll take questions at uh, specified times in the talk. All right. Well, Ari, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel and Drew, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to start this series in the Vantage Seminar on the Teresa cycle and algebraic cycles in general. And so I'm going to start out by talking about the general picture of algebraic cycles, though I'll do it pretty quickly and uh, briskly and not completely rigorously either, but just to give the big picture. Uh, and then I'll jump into some recent, uh, well, the definition of the Teresa cycle and some recent uh, work in that area. Uh, okay, so before we get into uh, the, real, the, the real definitions, here's the motivating question. In, in the area of algebraic cycles, or at least one of the motivating questions. So let X be an algebraic variety and Y and Y prime, two sub varieties. The one question that we might ask is, can we deform Y to Y prime algebraically and all inside X? So in other words, can we find a family of sub varieties of the same dimension that contains both Y and Y prime, an algebraic family? And that's not a precise definition, but, and there are different ways to make that definition, uh, that idea precise. But once you fix such a, an equivalence relation on sub-varieties, then the, the other basic question, of course, is going to be how many such equivalence classes uh, of sub-varieties of a given dimension do you have on X? So those are the two basic questions. For a pure algebraic geometer, I would guess that these are just you know, natural questions you're asking about the, the basic geometry of X and these equivalence classes that we'll talk about, Chow groups, Griffiths groups, their basic invariance of X. So I don't think I need to motivate it much further, but this is a, a number theory seminar. And so I, I do want to say that, of course, we can ask this question for varieties X over Q or over number fields. And what's nice is not just that it's a natural question, but there's very beautiful conjectural answer or a web of conjectures that attempts to answer these questions that involve L functions and Galois representations and objects that number theorists know and love. So uh, for me, at least that, that's more the motivation. Uh, although you'll see the most of the talk will actually be kind of pure algebraic geometry, but a lot of the motivation comes from connections uh, to, to arithmetic. Okay, so let's get down to the definitions. What is an algebraic cycle? So we'll let X be a smooth projective n-dimensional algebraic variety over a field K. And for each I, we consider the free abelian group uh, generated by closed irreducible sub-varieties of X of dimension I. And since I'm, I'm not necessarily assuming K is algebraically closed, so I write it this way, closed integral subschemes. Uh, so that I'm allowing Galois orbits of uh, irreducible sub-varieties over the algebraic closure. Um, so this is this formal definition, just we're looking at the formal sums of all sub-varieties of dimension I. Usually we'll actually want to refer to co-dimension, so we relabel sometimes, and Z upper I is uh, algebraic cycles of co-dimension I. And of course, as in the last slide, we want to now introduce an equivalence relation on this free abelian group to make it more interesting to, to, to um, yeah, to describe this notion, some kind of notion of when are two cycles deformable to each other? When are they equivalent? And there'll be two equivalence relations we'll talk about mostly today. The first is called out, uh, rational equivalence. And here I'll give you a slightly imprecise definition for rational equivalence on zi of x. So I'll tell you how to generate the equivalence relation. You consider all sub-varieties w of dimension one bigger, so dimension i plus one, and you consider all possible rational maps, non-zero, non-constant, let's say, uh, from w 
to, to P1. So all rational functions. And we, if you have such a map, the fibers of this map will be all dimension I, and they may not be irreducible, but we can turn, we can think of the fibers as an algebraic cycle of, uh, of dimension I with non-negative coefficients even. And rational equivalence means that we just declare all of these fibers for a given F, we declare all these fibers rationally equivalent to each other. And the point is we're viewing W itself, which is this sub, which is the subvariety that lives inside of X. We view W itself as a family of algebraic cycles of dimension I. And so it's in that sense in which you can deform one fiber to the other via W itself. So that's the notion of rational equivalence. And note that we have we have some kind of assumption, a severe assumption in some sense on the algebraic family W, namely that it's indexed by one parameter. It's over P1, which I think of as you know having a coordinate. It's a one parameter family. So the other notion of equivalence that we'll talk about is algebraic equivalence, which is the same exact thing, except now I don't restrict to one parameter families. I allow arbitrary algebraic families over a curve. Clearly, algebraic equivalence is a coarser equivalence relation. We're allowing many more algebraic families to generate the equivalence relation. Um, but per two you know, reasonable definitions, if you haven't seen this before, you can think about the case of co-dimension one, z upper one of x. Then we're talking about what we usually would just call divisors on x. And what we've defined as rational equivalence is the same in that case as linear equivalence, the usual notion of linear equivalence. And you know that case, that case is special, of course, when you have when you're considering co-dimension one cycles. This W, there's no choice for W. It, it has to be one dimension high, so it has to be X. And so the only thing you're considering when you're generating this equivalence relation is functions. And so you have the usual notion of principal divisors, divisors of functions. Yeah, already from just you know this example, you see a big difference between co-dimension one algebraic cycles and higher co-dimension algebraic cycles. In higher co-dimension, there's all these possibilities for W. And then there's all these possibilities also for F. Uh, so we'll see, co-dimension one cycles are much more complicated. So of course, once we have this notion of equivalence, we want to define the quotient. And so the Chow group, Chow lower I, this is co-dimension I cycles modulo rational equivalence. And as before, we write Chow upper I for, uh, oh, sorry, it's Chow lower I is dimension I cycles modulo rational equivalence, and Chow upper I is co-dimension uh, I algebraic cycles modulo rational equivalence. And I won't give a notation for the group modulo algebraic equivalence just yet, but I will define the subgroup of the Chow group considering uh, consisting of those cycles that are algebraically equivalent to zero, algebraically trivial. Because algebraic equival equivalence is coarser than rational equivalence, this, this makes sense. Um, okay, now historically the reason why people define the Chow group is not really to answer the first question or second question that I put in the motivating slide. It's more because this is what you need in order to have a well-defined, a well-behaved intersection uh, pairing on a, a good way to intersect sub-varieties and especially to do self-intersection via a moving lemma, et cetera. Um, and moreover, uh, you get very nice functoriality of Chow groups. So the point is that this, if you take the direct sum of all of the co-dimension I uh, Chow groups from I equals zero to N, you actually get a ring. So it's called the Chow ring. And the Chow groups and Chow rings behave nicely with respect to certain types of morphisms. I won't go into all the details, but under appropriate uh, hypotheses, you have pullback, you have push forward, and uh, you can see Fulton's book for uh, properties of, of Chow rings. But one, one other thing I'll just add is that the other motivation uh, for defining Chow groups is, and in general, defining equivalence relations is so that to set up a, a nice theory of motives. And, and, and for Chow groups, you would call these Chow motives. So this will come up later in the talk. I won't go into it now, but I also left a kind of a, a, a slide that talks a little bit about motives um, because I won't have time to really go into it. But this is an important concept uh, in algebraic geometry where we enlarge 
we we don't it's we create a more flexible category in which to work you, you need algebraic uh, some notion of equivalence to to do that so the question once you make these definitions and once you realize that these chow groups and chow rings that they have good properties abstract properties is okay concretely though how what do these groups look like how big are they and even more concretely if you give me two algebraic cycles of a given dimension, how do I know whether they are equivalent to each other in the Chow group or modulo algebraic equivalence? And unfortunately, from the definitions, like this is just not really very clear at all. This is a complicated definition. And so that's the main, what's one of the main questions in the whole area is to figure that out. So the first way we do it, and in general, the way we do it is we want to probe these Chow groups by writing down homomorphisms from the, the Chow group to groups that we already understand. And the most basic way to do this is the cycle class map. So here I'll let H upper star of X denote your favorite vague homology theory. So it could be singular cohomology with Q coefficients if we're working over the um, complex numbers, or it could be a tall cohomology, L attic cohomology, um, L prime to the characteristic. Uh, and I'll actually, for most of the time when I'm talking and kind of just discussing some examples, I'll actually take it to mean z, uh, singular cohomology with Z coefficients. So I'll be tacitly assuming K equals C, but you can run this in for general K. Uh, so we have some kind of cohomology theory and one has a cycle class map. So this is a homomorphism from Chow upper I to H to cohomology and degree two I. And for the case where we're over the complex numbers and where we're looking at singular cohomology, this is pretty easy to describe. We send the class of the irreducible subvariety to its homology class. So I think of the subvariety as, which is co-dimension I, as a real manifold. It now has co-dimension two I. And I just think, of, and I send it to its homology or by Poincaré duality, its cohomology class. So it lands in H2I of X. And this is nice. This, well, one checks that you get a well-defined homomorphism. It respects rational equivalence. It even factors through algebraic equivalence, uh, the cycle class map that I just described. So you get this homomorphism. And um, that's nice. It means you can break up the Chow group into two pieces, the image of the cycle class map and the kernel, of the cycle class map. And the kernel is called the subgroup of homologically trivial cycles. So that's notation we give. And, you know, homological equivalence is actually another notion of equivalence. It just says two cycles are homologically equivalent if they agree in cohomology, if they have the same image under the cycle class map. So then the basic question is, uh, okay, what can we say about the two pieces? And the image of the cycle class map is kind of controlled. So it's a finitely generated abelian group. It's easy to see it in this case because it's a subgroup of a finitely generated abelian group, this integral cohomology. Um, and okay, you could ask more. You could ask, well, okay, what is there a way to compute what the rank of that finitely generated abelian group is? Well, that's the content of the Hodge or the Tate conjecture. Uh, so that's hard. Uh, it's very, a huge open question, one of the main open questions in algebraic geometry, but at least there's a, a prediction. Uh, the homologically trivial part of the child group is a murkier thing. It's harder to understand uh, what this group is, how big it can be. You, the first case to consider is the case of co-dimension one. And here you, we have a pretty good control at least in the abstract over this group, it turns out that in this case, the homologically trivial cycles, where we're, we're, uh, we're just considering uh, divisors module uh, linear equivalents that are, uh, well, that are trivial in cohomology. And this is the connected component of the identity of the Picard variety of, of X. And so it's some abelian, it's the group of K points of some abelian variety. So the structure of that group will, of course, depend on the, the ground field. If K is the complex numbers, you'll get a complex torus of some dimension. Um, and it, or if K is a number field, you'll get a finitely generated abelian group by the Mordell-Weil theorem. 
but you have some control over what what this uh, this group is in that case. So that's co-dimension one. Higher co-dimension, it's just not true anymore that it, you can think of this group as points on an abelian variety or any variety, really. Uh, this was an observation made by Mumford. He has a short paper and he argues and justifies that uh, when the co-dimension is bigger than one, it's often the case, not for every X, but it's often the case for that this homologically trivial subgroup is infinite dimensional in some sense, which I won't go into. We'll just say that it, it's very, very big in a certain sense, and it's hard to control, uh, hard to understand uh, when K is the complex numbers. We're number theorists here, some of us at least. So we want to ask, well, what about when K is a number field? And there, at least conjecturally, it should be the case that this even the homologically trivial part of the child group should be finitely generated. This is a conjecture more coming from K theory uh, of Hyman Bass. But this is a very open conjecture. It's known in certain very special cases. But once the cohomology of X has kind of is, is interesting, has a lot of non-zero Hodge numbers, let's say, then uh, this conjecture is very hard and, and completely open. Um, nonetheless, even though we don't even know for sure that these or at all, that uh, these Chow groups are finally generated, we can also try to predict the rank of that group. And this is a, a conjecture of valence and block, which is a vast generalization of the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. And it says that the rank of that homologically trivial subgroup is the order of vanishing at the central point of, an L, of the L function attached to degree two I minus one uh, cohomology, uh, the atal cohomology of X. And this is also very much open. Um, it's only known in, in some very specific and only really partially known in some very specific types of cases, um, but it's a beautiful conjecture. Um, when taken together with the Hodge conjecture and the Tate conjecture, what the picture that emerges is that if you want to understand cohomology, at least over a number field, then it's enough to understand, uh, sorry, if you want to understand the Chow group of a smooth projective variety over a number field, then you can read it off of its cohomology. The even part of cohomology tells you about the image of the cycloclass map, and the odd part of cohomology tells you about the kernel of the cycloclass map via the L function. So via, yeah. And um, this is very, very open, as I was saying, but you know, for us, for the rest of the talk, we'll mostly not really get into arithmetic phenomenon. Um, because this, we're only at the very beginning of the of the story of the Teresa class, so we're still working out its algebraic geometry. But already this conjecture, you can try to use it to try to predict when certain uh, curves have trivial Teresa class, um, which I haven't defined yet. But more generally, if you happen to know something about this L function, and you happen to know that its analytic rank is zero, or conjecturally it's zero, then that will tell you that this part of the child group has to be torsion, is, uh, or we expect it to be torsion. And so even these conjectures can give you good hints uh, as to where to search for varieties with certain properties. Okay, the question I wanna get into now is, first of all, in this conjecture, why is H to the two I minus one uh, relevant? And more generally, like how do we actually in practice probe the homologically trivial subgroup? the way we did uh, with the image using the cycle class map. And we do this via Abel Jacobi maps. And so I'll go over the classical classical case first. So that's the case where our variety X is, X is a curve C. And I'll let V be the space of holomorphic differentials on our curves. So this is a G-dimensional complex vector space. I'm working over the complex numbers here. Um, G is the genus of the curve. And lambda, let's let lambda be the homology lattice. So by definition, the Jacobian of the curve is the quotient of V star, so C linear functionals on uh, differentials, modulo the lattice lambda. So the point is that lambda naturally embeds in this space of functionals because if I give you a loop on your on my on the Riemann surface, and I give you a differential form, then you can integrate the differential form over the loop. And so, 
you have this complex torus. This is a G-dimensional complex torus called the Jacobian. And we use the Jacobian as a way to probe the homologically trivial subgroup, which in this case, we're talking about divisors on a curve. So we're really just talking about divisors modulo linear equivalents. If you think about a degree zero divisors modulo linear equivalents, right? If you think about the cycle class map in this case, it's really just the degree map uh, where you take the sum of the coefficients of the points in the divisor. And the Abel Jacobi map is this probe. It's a homomorphism to the Jacobian. And what is that homomorphism? Well, every degree zero divisor can be written as a sum of degree of divisors of this form, P minus Q for two points, P and Q on the curve. And you send this divisor to the linear functional, which is integrate your omega over a path from P to Q. And of course that really will depend on the path that you chose. But because we modded out by lambda, by homology, you get something well-defined. You get a well-defined linear functional in the, in the Jacobian. And the theorem of Abel and Jacobi from the 19th century is that this homomorphism is actually an isomorphism of groups. And so that tells you, um, yeah, I mean, let me remark that that also tells you that if you fix Q, and you just think about P varying, then you get a map from the curve into the Jacobian. And as long as the genus G is at least one, this, this map we know is, is an embedding. Um, yeah, of course, if you're working over a general field, not necessarily the complex numbers, nowadays we do something, we do things differently. We define the Jacobian to be the algebraic, the abelian variety that parameterizes isomorphism classes of degree zero line bundles, but you can get at it from this way over the complex numbers. Uh, and the other thing I wanna mention about this example is that where did this V come from? You can think of V as half of the Hodge structure of the Hodge filtration on H1 of the curve with C coefficients. Uh, we're taking the holomorphic differentials and ignoring the anti-holomorphic differentials. So it's the, it's the more holomorphic half of the Hodge structure. And this construction Griffiths realized in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, um, that it generalizes to arbitrary X, smooth projective, and arbitrary co-dimension I. And so he, this uh, Griffiths defines the intermediate Jacobian. I'll give you kind of two equivalent definitions. One is it's H2I minus one singular cohomology. This is, remember, this is the cohomology we were going to connect to homologically trivial cycles. Modulo the, the first half, the holomorphic half of its Hodge structure. And then also modulo the corresponding lattice. So that's one way to define it. This is some complex torus. And it turns out it's even an abelian variety. Um, it has an algebraic structure. But it's just like over here, it's some complex torus. If you want to understand it in the same way as we did with in the case of a curve, then you should use Poincaré duality uh, to view this isomorphism, uh, this complex torus, in terms of the complementary degree cohomology. So H2n minus 2i plus 1. And now I have to dualize. And I, this is a typo. I should, everything in this top line is being dualized. And because instead of looking at the quotient H2i minus one mod the first half of the Hodge structure, this fill I, we look at the first half of the Hodge structure in the complementary degree, and then you dualize that. And then you look modulo the homology lattice on the dual space. And when you think about it this way, it, we can define a, an Abel Jacobi map in exactly the same way we send uh, a homologically trivial algebraic cycle of co-dimension i to the functional, which is integrate, uh, you know, our special differential forms of a certain kind over a bounding chain for z. The point here is that z is homologically trivial, so it's the boundary of some cycle of real dimension one greater. And when you work out the numerology here, we're integrating a real cycle over a real differential form of exactly complementary degree. And so we're gonna get a, a number. And as before, you check that you get 
a well-defined homomorphism from the Chow IX HOM, homological trivial subgroup, to uh, the intermediate Jacobian, the Griffiths intermediate Jacobian. Now, by this observation of Mumford, there's no chance, there's no way that this oblog Jacobi map is injective in this case. Um, for, it's very often not injective when, for X here defined over the complex numbers, but there's a conjecture of balance and block. This is related to the balance and block conjecture uh, that if X is defined over Q bar and we restrict the oblog Jacobi map to algebraic cycles that are defined over Q bar, then it actually should be injective, at least modulo torsion. Um, yeah. And then that, that, that's an expectation. That's a hard, very open conjecture. But at least if we grant this conjecture, then it means that this map is a faithful probe of, well, at least of infinite order cycles at least those that are defined over a Q bar. And if I work over a general field, then you can't really use that construction, but you can, there's an analogous construction in, in a tall cohomology. And in particular, let's say we're working over a number field, you can, there's this a tall Apple Jacobi map that I won't define, but it's um, entirely analogous uh, to the Hodge theoretic construction. And it maps to some group cohomology group, but again, with coefficients in H2I minus one. And this time, because here I assume K is a number field, so X is just defined over a number field already, Balance and a block would predict that the kernel is, is torsion. And so again, you have a faithful probe of the homologically trivial subgroups. Um, and there are other probes. There are not too many other ones, but another one which is related is what's called the Balance and block height, but I won't go, get into this Balance and block height uh, too much in this talk. In Dick's talk, you'll see a little bit more about it. Um, okay, so any questions on anything I've said so far? I'll just see where I'm at. These conjectures are, are proved in some cases, or? Like this conjectural torsion, for example? Yeah. Um, in co-dimension one, it's true. This is, and it's not that hard. And then it is, yeah, it is, there are certain cases where it's proven, but but there, I would say that it's because almost for trivial reasons, like there are, I don't know of like a case where it's proven in high co-dimension. Um, that's not for some very, for the reason that maybe, you know, this cohomology group is just zero or something uh, like this. Uh, well, even that is, there's something non-trivial to prove, but you can sometimes prove it. Um, it's, I think Valia in her talk, she'll talk a lot about this Abel Jacobi map and you will hear her say that, you know, this is completely open and, you know, zero cycles on an abelian surface. This is completely open and it's, yeah, there are not too many interesting examples where it's actually known. Okay. Um, so let's get more into the story of the Teresa cycle now. We, from the discussion above, we have a chain of subgroups in the Chow group. We have the homologically trivial cycles, that's, which is the kernel of the cycle class map. You have the algebraically trivial cycles, which, as I said, the cycle class map factors through algebraically trivial cycles. So that's a subgroup of this. And of course, you have you know the zero subgroup. And when the codimension is one, these two middle guys are equal to each other, it, it turns out. And so you, you have this quotient, which is some finitely generated group. And then you have this quotient, which is the group of points of an abelian variety, and that's it. But in higher co-dimension, Griffiths showed that that's just not true anymore. That for all i greater than or equal to two, you can find examples where it's not true that homological equivalence is equal to algebraic equivalence. His example was you take two lines on a quintic threefold, a very general quintic threefold, and you can check that the cycle class map uh, maps to a one-dimensional you know, vector space and it's gener gener spanned by the class and of any line. And so these two lines will have the same cycle class map. Their difference gives you an element in Chow upper two hom. And Griffiths showed using the Apple Jacobi map, I'm not gonna go over the proof or anything, but using the Apple Jacobi map, in co-dimension two, Griffith showed that, in fact, typically this algebraic cycle is infinite order, 
And it's not just that it's infinite order in the chapter, but even modulo algebraic equivalence, it's infinite order. So nowadays we, we call this quotient chow i of x hum mod chow i of x alg, uh, the Griffiths group in co-dimension i. And well, because Griffiths was the one to sh first one to show that it can be not zero and even infinite. And soon after Clemens showed that in fact, it can have infinite rank as an abelian group. Um, but one also knows that it's at most countable. So, you know, this can't be like a complex torus or anything like this. It doesn't, this, this set does not have geometry, presumably. It's just some countable set, but it can be very large. What Clemens showed it also in the case of uh, curves or one cycles on qu the quintic threefolds. And basically the, we're at this stage in the story where you know, let's let's say we're working over a number field. We would love to say things like, let's try to study, like on, you know, typically what is the rank of the chow group, chow two, chow upper two of X for some, you know, threefold. But we have no idea that that's even a finitely generated abelian group. So we have no way, and, and even in examples, we don't know uh, how to prove that. It, for any, as I was kind of saying earlier, any interesting examples, we don't know how to prove that. And so there's very little we can kind of say about how big the chow group is. But what we can at least ask is, given a situation where the geometry gives us for free homologically trivial cycles, what happens? Are they trivial in the Chow group? Are they trivial in the Griffiths group? Are they torsion maybe in the Chow group or the Griffiths group? And you know, we're exactly asking this question from the beginning, at least for the case of you know two lines. We're asking, is L deform algebraically deformable to L prime? And Griffith's answer is no, it's not in general, even when you use algebraic equivalence. Um, and there are, there are two kind of simplest cases of this phenomenon. The first is this case of Griffith's quintic threefold, lines on a quintic threefold. But I would say that the simplest case from a geometric perspective is the case of a Teresa cycle. So using just a curve, one constructs uh, a homologically trivial algebraic cycle that has a chance of being algebraically non-trivial. So let's get into the definition of the Teresa cycle. Uh, so C is now a curve of genus at least two over a field, and E will be a, de a divisor of degree one that I'm going to use to embed my curve into my Jacobian via the usual map. You send a point to the divisor X minus E, which has degree zero, so it gives me a well-defined element of the Jacobian, which remember is this abelian variety of dimension G that parametrizes uh, divisor classes of degree zero modulo linear equivalents. And it's important here that I'm allowing myself an arbitrary divisor of degree one, not just a, a base point. So it's really, I might call this a base point, but it's a base divisor. So I embed my curve into the Jacobian. But notice that I could have done it in a different way. I could have embedded, I could have mapped X to E minus X instead of X minus E. In other words, I could have uh, composed this iota, the embedding with the automorphism minus one on the Jacobian. And what we do to define the Teresa cycle is we just take this copy of the curve sitting inside the Jacobian. I think of that as an algebraic one cycle, dimension one. And I subtract off this other algebraic one cycle, which this is, I'm using this pullback notation, but it, this just means the other curve that you get by embedding C into, Jacob, into the Jacobian and then composing with minus one. And this is an element of Chow 1J. We're thinking of it in the, in the Chow group. We could think of it as just an algebraic cycle, but almost always we will just think of it in the Chow group. But I claim it's even homologically trivial. And it's easy to see this, and it's because we know how minus one acts on H1 of the Jacobian. It acts as minus one. And uh, H2G minus two, which is the target of the cycle class map in this case, right? This is co-dimension G minus one, so H2G minus two. Uh, that's some even wedge power of H1, and so minus one upper star will act as plus one. And so this class, in cohomology, this class is the same as this class. And so their difference is zero. And so we get a homologically trivial algebraic cycle from any curve. Now, there is this annoying dependence on the base point, um, but 
one convenient thing we can do is if we care about this cycle only modulo algebraic equivalence, then it's independent of the base point. It's not hard to show. And so we let kappa gr of c be the image of kappa e of c in the Griffiths group, and that is independent of the choice of e. And the, the entire question of the talk in some sense is, is this zero or not in the Griffiths group? And, and then later we'll also talk about the child group. And what we're asking is, again, exactly the question from the beginning. I have these two very natural ways to embed my curve in the Jacobian. Uh, are they deformable to each other? And it's surprising that, that this is an, an interesting question because I just did something very simple. I just scaled one of the embeddings by minus one inside of this complex torus. But it turns out that this is very subtle, as I was saying. It's hard to tell when two cycles are the same in, in Chow or in the Griffiths group. Um, but that's the question. And uh, Therese approved, this is why it's called the Therese cycle, that for a very general curve over the complex numbers of genus G, at least three, this algebraic cycle, this element of the, the Griffiths group is not just not zero, but it's even infinite order. Um, you need to have genus at least three, just because if the genus is two, we're talking about co-dimension one, algebraic cycles. And then as we saw, homological equivalence is equal to algebraic equivalence in that case. So you need genus at least three for this. But once the genus is at least three, then for a very general curve of that genus, this class is infinite order, meaning in the moduli space mg of genus g curves, there's a countable union of proper closed subvarieties where um, this might fail. But outside of that measure zero subset of the moduli space, the Teresa class in the Griffith group is infinite order. Um, I should say, like, what does it mean to be torsion? Like, this is saying it's not even torsion. You can interpret being torsion in the Griffiths group or the Chow group as, as saying that the, these two one cycles are set theoretically, uh, you know, deformable to each other as opposed to scheme theoretically. So even this notion of being torsion or not torsion um, has a geometric meaning. I won't talk about the proof. Uh, you, in Dick's talk in a few weeks, Dick Hain, you'll see proofs or discussion of proofs uh, that are of much stronger statements. Uh, also in Padma's talk next week, you'll see how to show that trace of cycles are non-zero uh, or, or let's say infinite order. Um, Okay, that's the more typical uh, thing. The question of today's talk is, well, do there exist curves with, with torsion or with zero, with just zero Teresa cycle in the Griffiths group or in the Chow group? And right away, there's one example that is that where it's, you see right away that it holds, namely that of an elliptic curve, a hyper elliptic curve. Um, so if C is hyperelliptic and we choose as our base point a Weierstrass point, then it's easy to see that actually even in the group of algebraic cycles, algebraic one cycles, this algebraic cycle is, is zero. And, and that's just because I won't go, you can read the proof, but it, it just follows from the fact that the hyperelliptic involution, it acts as minus one on the Jacobian. And so these two curves in the definition of the Teresa cycle um, they're actually the same. These two embeddings are, they're the same embedding. Uh, well, they're, they're not the same embedding, but their image is the same curve. And so the Teresa class, the Teresa cycle even is just zero. But in particular, it means that for any choice of base point, when you look in the Griffiths group, you're gonna also get zero. Uh, so that's one whole class of examples where um, the curve uh, has uh, torsion or even just zero Teresa uh, cycle or class in the Griffiths group. And th the truth is that there, for yeah, for a while, there just were no other examples. And so this led Clemens to ask the following question. Is it true that the, it, that the Teresa class in the Griffiths group is zero if and only if C is hyperelliptic? Um, and as you'll see from some examples, as we go into the talk, nowadays there's evidence that maybe this isn't true, and so I suspect that's not true. Although I can't give a you know proof, but I but I love the spirit of this question, which is that 
the Teresa class should vanish only if there's a good geometric reason for it to vanish. And I think, and Clemens is asking it just because, you know, there is out of, it's an empirical you know, statement and same with me, like, but now we have more and more empirical and theoretical evidence that something like this might be true. So you, this is kind of the mantra of the talk, but you could also take it as a challenge. So th for the whole series, uh, if you ever find in, in some of the future talks, we'll see examples of possibly torsion tra uh, tracer cycles or maybe provably torsion tracer cycles or zero trace the cycles and you can think of it as a challenge to find a good geometric reason for that to be the case uh, and as is already implicit in what I'm saying there are different versions of this question that's that's why I don't take the exact formulation of the question so seriously for example I I maybe might believe this question as a positive answer if we instead of looking in the Griffiths group we look in the Chow group so Evi there's some evidence that, not evidence for a positive answer, but I don't see any evidence against it. Um, and so there are versions of this question that you can ask. In the, are we asking in the Griffiths group? Are we asking in the Chow group? Are we asking for zero on the nose? Or are we asking for it to just be torsion? Um, so different versions and all of them are, are interesting. And I would apply this mantra to, to all versions of that question. Uh, okay. So that's the question. And like I said, for a while there was no, there were no counterexamples or exceptions besides for these hyperelliptic curves, which is just some very immediately true uh, example of curves. And um, recently there's some examples, but to discuss them and especially to discuss what's happening in the child group, I need to go into one technicality, namely this annoying dependence on the base point. Um, so let K be the canonical divisor or the class of the canonical divisor in the Picard group. Here's a lemma that one can prove. Um, you can find this in one of Jeff and I's, Jeff Laga and I's papers. Um, so if the Teresa class based at the degree one divisor E is torsion in the Chow group, remember this is an element of the Chow group, then one can show that 2g minus 2 times e is the canonical divisor uh, in the Picard group tensor Q. In other words, up to torsion, e is a root of the canonical divisor. And so what this lemma shows is that for questions of vanishing and torsion of trace classes, you might as well should assume that e is a root of the canonical divisor. Um, because you know the answer if it's not, it's in that if it's not, then the Teresa class will have infinite order. And also those other, if e, if this is not true in pick C tensor Q, then you're not looking at genuine co-dimension two phenomenon. You're more looking at co-dimension one phenomena. And so the interesting case is the case where E is a root of the canonical divisor. And we may as well assume, and we now from now on do assume that. And the thing is, once you make that assumption, you can actually, at least if you're willing to ignore a little bit of torsion, you can completely remove the dependence on the base point. Um, and I'll assume from now on that the characteristic is zero just to avoid some annoying inseparability issues. So how many such divisors on the curve are there That's that are 2g minus 2 roots of the canonical divisor? There's a finite number of them. There are this many of them. And they all differ from each other by torsion and the Picard group and the Jacobian. Um, and when you construct their corresponding Teresa classes, kappa E of C, those also will differ by some tor by torsion. All of them will differ from each other by torsion. And so if you just kill your torsion, if you look instead in, in Chow 1 tensor Q, you get a well-defined class that does now does not depend on any choices. And so this is what we call kappa of C. And it's I'm doing this basically just for convenience. It's very interesting to think about in cases where the class is torsion to actually think about what is its order. But for convenience, we will just view it in this group tensor Q. And now questions of is the class torsion or not, it's equivalent to asking, is this one canonical class uh, zero or not? And this canonical nature 
of this class means that it actually it it always descends to the ground field, right? Like the, you may not have such degree one divisors over your ground field, but it doesn't matter because this class that we've defined as canonical, uh, this class will always descend down to the ground field. So over any field, a curve uh, has this canonical trace of class. Okay, so that's a definition just to allow us to state things in a cleaner way. And we can just talk about the trace of class uh, for a curve over a field. And now I get to this recent kind of flurry of work on the Teresa class and the question of when does it vanish in the Chow group and the Griffiths group, et cetera. So this started with a paper maybe three or four years ago of Bisogno, Lee, Lit, and Srinivasan. And they showed that the Abel Jacobi image of the Teresa class of the Frickham McBeath curve, which is the unique genus seven Hurwitz curve, so curve with largest possible automorphism group, uh, that it's trivial. Um, well, in my notation, which really means if you don't tensor with Q that the Abel Jacobi image is torsion. Um, and here G is the automorphism group and they're gonna use, I'll, I'll give a proof in a second. And all of these examples that I'm about to talk about, they use the fact that the curves have interesting automorphisms. So soon after this example, Beauville gave a similar example. This time it's a genus three curve. Um, it's a curve with an automorphism of order nine. You can, if you're bored, you can try to find an automorphism of order nine on, on that plane coordinate curve. And he also showed that in that example, the Abel Jacobi image of the Teresa class is zero. And both of these curves are defined over Q bar. And so if you believe balance and block, it should mean that the Teresa class itself should be torsion or cap of C should be zero. But their proofs don't quite show it. But in any case, let's here's here's how you can prove their results. Um, we use the fact that the Abel Jacobi map, the higher Abel Jacobi map that we defined, it's G equivariant. It's so the Abel Jacobi maps you, you can imagine, it's a functorial construction. And so it means that it's G equivariant for the the G action on both the source and the target. G again is the automorphism group of the curve. Now, on the other hand, the, the Teresa class cap of C is a canonical thing. So it's G invariant, it's preserved by all uh, automorphisms of the curve. And that means that the Abel Jacobi map has to send cap of C to some element of the intermediate Jacobian that is fixed by G. But you can compute using a tangent space computation, using differential forms or different ways to do this computation, you can compute in these for these two curves that the G invariant part of the intermediate Jacobian is, is finite. And so when I tensor with Q, you get zero. And so it follows that Abel Jacobi of cap of C is zero. So that's, that's a sketch of the proof. Now, we would like to know that this cap of C in these examples is torsion, even in the Chow group. And so this, this was then proved maybe a year later by Song Ling Chu and Wei Zhang, and they gave a cohomological criterion. So they showed more generally that, uh, or in general, that if this, you know, H1C, this is a G-dimensional representation of G, and then I take its tensor cube, <clears throat> so I get some, you know, G cubed dimensional, oh, sorry, it's not G-dimensional, it's 2G dimensional. So I get, I get, you know, some eight G cube dimensional G representation. If it has no G invariance, then the trace of class is torsion and the Chow group is half of C is zero. That's their proof. Their proof gives an unconditional, it proves it unconditionally for the Frick McBeath curve uh, because the Frick McBeath curve satisfies this condition that H1C tensor Q tensor cube has no G invariance, which you can check. Um, it doesn't prove it for the Beauville's curve, but you can <clears throat> strengthen their criterion a bit. So this is this first result with Jeff that I'm gonna talk about. And there's actually a smaller G representation that you can use to check for triviality of kappa of C, namely H3 of J. So if H3 of J has no G invariance, then the trace of class is zero. And notice the H3 of J, this is wedge three of H1 of C, and so we're we're using it wedge three of H1 instead of 
tensor three of H1. So you're getting it's a much smaller representation. Um, in fact, you can even use a small, a slightly smaller representation, which when the quotient genus is zero, they're the same, but this is a slightly stronger statement. That's a little bit technical, so I didn't, I didn't write it out in detail. Um, but you get, a, you get various examples of curves with torsion Theresa class by either this theorem or uh, even the Q Jean theorem already gives you plenty of examples. Um, so for example, here's another genus three curve for which it follows. This one follows from the Q Zhang result. The Beauville shown curve, the Beauville curve, um, which was also studied by Chad Schoen, that does satisfy this uh, this condition in, in the theorem on the slide. So that one also has torsion Theresa class. In fact, those are the only two non-hyperelliptic genus three curves for which this theorem applies. Um, so, there are lots of curves in higher genus. So if you keep going in higher genus, you'll find lots of curves, but you, you, this is still kind of a very rare phenomenon. You should be think, you should think of this criterion as very, very strong, this condition. And so it's only it only holds kind of pretty rarely. There are only two non-hyperliptic genus three curves with it satisfying it. But then you, there, if you just start looking for curves with big automorphism groups, and then you go and you compute uh, what this, the G invariance of H3 or JR, which is a computation that you can do um, in magma sometimes or using the chevalier ve theorem or using just explicit writing down differential forms explicitly, um, you'll find examples. I don't know, so I've, I've listed a bunch of examples and I've listed some, you know, here's a one parameter family of genus four curves that satisfy um, the hypotheses. There's a two-dimensional family in genus five. There are, there are a bunch of families. I don't know whether there are families or even single examples in arbitrarily large genus, aside from hyperelliptic curves. Um, I think that's an interesting question. I don't know whether they exist, but whenever this condition holds, the trace of class is, is torsion. Um, one interesting thing is that once you know that the Teresa class of C is, is torsion, then any subcover of C also has that property. And so for example, the Beauville, uh, no, the, the Frick McBeath curve has a genus three quotient. So by you know the Q Zhang theorem, that genus three quotient also has torsion Teresa class, even though uh, that genus three quotient doesn't satisfy even the stronger hypothesis here. And so it's not clear exactly which curves, um, you know, you learn have torsion Theresa class from this theorem because the question is kind of, is there a curve that covers it with big automorphism group that satisfies the condition? And I really, that question, I have no idea how to answer, but it's, again, it seems like an interesting question for people who understand automorphism groups of curves really well. Okay, so this is, one way to get vanishing, uh, you know, examples of curves with vanishing Teresa class in the child group. And by vanishing, I really mean torsion. Um, what about in the Griffiths group? So here's a criterion in the Griffiths group for vanishing or torsion in the Griffiths group. So recall V is our G dimensional vector space of holomorphic differential forms. Here now, now I'm working over C. Maybe I, I didn't say it on the slides, but right from, from now on, let's just work over the complex numbers because I'm about to invoke the, the Hodge conjecture. And um, yeah, so let's assume the Hodge conjecture for abelian varieties. If, assuming that if wedge three of V has no G invariance, then the class of the Teresa cycle in the Griffiths group is torsion. And so what I'm doing, it's it's a similar looking criterion. It's it's again wedge three, but it's wedge three of V, which is kind of half of H1 of C. So it's a much smaller representation. And so it has a much, you would think of it as having, I mean, it, it does have a much like more likely chance of, of holding uh, this, this condition. Um, so there, yeah, there are lots of curves. There are more curves that satisfy this condition. I'll give some examples in a second. Uh, but maybe before the examples, you might be wondering, well, what case of the Hodge conjecture do we really need? And so here's the point. This condition, it implies, it doesn't imply that H3 of J, the G invariant part, is zero, so which is what the, the previous condition implies. Um, 
but rather it implies that this Hodge structure, H3 of J, the G invariant part, is weight one up to twist. And so that means that it's the Hodge structure associated to an abelian variety. And what we need is the Hodge conjecture for J cross A. If you know the Hodge conjecture for J cross A, then that tells you that this isomorphism of Hodge structures comes from an isomorphism of motives. It tells you that there's an algebraic correspondence between J and A um, that induces this isomorphism on cohomology. And that's what we actually need in the proof. Okay, so now let's look at some examples. So here's a two-dimensional family in the moduli space M3. So two-dimensional family of genus three curves um, that do satisfy this hypothesis. Um, and in fact, in, so in this case, um, this A, it turns out to just be an elliptic curve. And so you need the Hodge conjecture for a three-dimensional Jacobian cross an, an elliptic curve, but this four-dimensional abelian variety, it turns out to have what are called vague classes. So this is a hard case of the Hodge conjecture, but thankfully Chad Schoen in the 90s proved the, the relevant case. And so this is actually an unconditional statement for the Picard family, family of Picard curves in genus three. Um, I should say that for these kind of cyclic covers, sometimes you can see that this condition holds with your own eyes. Uh, so you can do the computation with differential forms if you want. Um, this is a, these are called Picard curves. This is the first, the most famous example of a U21 Picard modular surface. And so uh, the, the corresponding Shimura variety. And, you know, U21 is telling you, the 21 is telling you the signature. And it's telling you that the, as a, you know, G here is just C3, the group of order three. And the 21 is telling you that this V, which is a three dimensional vector space, as a G representation, its character is two copies of one order three character and one copy of the complex conjugate. And now wedge three of V is just the product of those three characters, which from that description, you see right away, it's not it's a non-trivial character. And so you see that you get you don't get um, you do get zero here because you got a non-zero character. You didn't get the trivial character. Um, and there are other families where this hypothesis holds. Again, I don't know whether they exist in arbitrarily large genus, but here's a Teich Miller curve in genus four this is a very pretty example. Here, the Hodge conjecture turns out to be easy. So this is also unconditional. Um, here's a very interesting example that I don't know much about this, the Torelli locus in U22 and in, in the U22 Schumer variety for Q adjoined square root minus three. And here's just an explicit equation. This is a three-dimensional family of genus uh, four curves. I don't know what A is in this case. I didn't work it out. It's non-trivial to even work that out. And so I therefore don't know whether what the, what the Hodge conjecture uh, case is and whether it's easy or not. Um, and then there are other families in genus five, six, eight, and they, they keep... Uh, I don't know whether there are families in arbitrarily large genus. It's an interesting question. Um, okay, I'm running out of time. So I will quickly sketch the proof of these um, results. The idea is to use the structure of the Chow motive of the Jacobian, which being an abelian variety and even principally polarized, it has tons of interesting structure. And I don't want to say much about Chow motives. Um, I gave a slide at the end for people who want to learn a little bit more. But uh, so let me just say the proof kind of assuming you know a little bit about Chow motives. What you do is you you show that trace uh, or kappa of C is zero if and only if when you project onto a certain part of the Chow group of J that the class of C, that that class is uh, zero. And that class, it lives in, in uh, the Chow group of a submotive of J, namely the, the submotive H3 of J, G. And this should be intuitively clear. It's somehow like the Albo Jacobi map uh, is governed by um, H2G minus three, as we were saying. And then, it, okay, that's by. Poincaré duality, that's the same thing as saying H3 of J, G. And the assumption of the theorem is that this is 
not the trivial motive, but it has trivial cohomology. But there's this beautiful theorem of Kimura that tells you for submotives of abelian varieties, having trivial cohomology means that the motive itself is trivial, and it just immediately follows from that that kappa of C is torsion. The Griffiths version um, is similar, except this time we don't know that the motive is zero. What we know is that modulo the the Hodge conjecture that it's isomorphic to the motive of to H1 of an abelian variety. And so under this isomorphism, the Teresa class is being sent to a co-dimension one cycle on an abelian variety, but co-dimension one on an abelian variety, homologically trivial means algebraically trivial, and, and that's how you conclude um, that proof. So it's algebraically trivial, at least up to torsion. When you work with these motives, you some, somehow the machinery only works after you tensor with Q. So we these proofs only work for proving torsion and not for proving that anything vanishes. Um, okay, I'm really running out of time, so I will just state one more theorem, uh, if Rachel and Drew will let me. Um, so the basically, these examples that we've seen up until now, I view them as kind of group theoretic or representation theoretic. And it's almost like that for some reason, the symmetries of the curve give you cancellation in the Teresa class. And so that's why you get a torsion Teresa class, either in the Griffiths group or the Trout group. So the question is, in the spirit of Clemens' question, are there cases where even though you, there are no group theoretic reasons for it to vanish, are there geometric reasons or other just are there other types of examples? And here um, is one, one example of that type. We consider we go back to the family of Picard curves from before, where i cubed equals a quartic. And as we said, these curves have algebraically trivial trace class, or at least torsion trace class, but the but they don't in general have torsion trace class in the Chow group. Um, but we'll, what we do is we give a criterion for exactly which of them do. So first we define these classical I and J invariants of a binary quartic form. Um, these formulas are due to you know, the invariant theorists of the 19th century. And they observed that the I and J invariants satisfy this nice relationship with the discriminant of F. And what you can do is, you, what this means is you write down this point, I of F, J of F, this is a point on the elliptic curve given by this equation, just from that relation. And um, that seems random. I've just constructed a point on some random elliptic curve, all coming from the information of this polynomial F. So it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the cubic, uh, with the quartic genus three curve. But what Jeff and I show is that kappa of CF the trace the class of this curve is torsion in the Chow group if and only if this point on this auxiliary elliptic curve is torsion in the elliptic curve. And the point here is that for a typical A, B, and C, for a typical Picard curve, this point will not be torsion. And in fact, you, we know exactly how these points distribute. Um, we know the geometry of this family of elliptic curves very, very well. And so, but we're pointing out some very, very special curves in the family that do have torsion trace cycle. It's whenever this PF happens to be a torsion point on the elliptic curve uh, EF. Um, and I have a sketch of the proof. I think I'll just leave it in the slides. What I'll say is that it works, at least in theory, more generally in any situation where you have a family of curves where fiber-wise the Teresa class is algebraically trivial, you can at least set up the, the proof, but implementing it is a whole other question and, and I'll leave the, the details in the slides which people can look at. Um, but I think for time reasons, I'll just uh, stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ari. Uh, and before we continue, let me say that our next talk is September 10th by Padma Srinivasan.